Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Aninda, and I have uh, Karthik with me, and we'll be taking care of the technology section of today's presentation. Um, so the basic agenda for the technology session is we're going to start off uh, with the iOS upgrades. Uh, we'll be covering uh, boot variables, config registers, uh, ROM and recovery, and all of that. Uh, we'll move on to high CPU. And we're going to cover uh, most of your Catalyst platforms, which will be 3K, 4K, and the 6500. Uh, we're going to finish that off with a live demo uh, of high CPU troubleshooting, uh, which should give you more insight uh, about what to do when the situation arises. Uh, from there, we're going to talk about crashes and layer one troubleshooting, and uh, just good information that you can pull out of the show interface output. So let's, let's start off with the, the iOS upgrades. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is basically how and where to look for software. Uh, so what you want to do is uh, you need to go over to the Cisco.com site. And if you look at the tabs on top, you can see uh, several options there, which are product and services, uh, support, how to buy, uh, and so on, right? So you need to hover over the support tab. That gives you uh, a drop-down menu. Uh, you can see you have product support uh, downloads and your cases. So you can open tag cases uh, via, via these tabs as well. But what we're interested in is the download section. So there's a text box there where you can put in your uh, product number. So that is basically the device that you're interested in uh, that you want a software image for. right? So as an example, uh, I've put in 6500 here. Uh, now, of course, it depends on the various combinations uh, of the device, uh, and you get a drop-down menu for that. Uh, so in our example, we get all the supervisors that are compatible with the 6500. And in this situation, I'm choosing uh, the SUP 720 with the MSFC3. Right? Once, you, once you're focused on, on the specific device, uh, you get your choices of downloading uh, either ROM on uh, software for it or the iOS software and so on. So for this, we are interested in the iOS uh, software. Of course, if you want the ROM on image, you can always uh, click on that as well. So once you click on the iOS uh, software, uh, you land up in a page where you're uh, given all of the publicly available uh, software images to download. Uh, the download will, of course, uh, require uh, a login with your uh, valid credentials. Um, a, a key thing to note here is um, if you look at, there, there's a small tick mark next to certain images. And this is very important to understand because this is uh, something that Cisco calls a safe harbor image. And uh, safe harbor is basically an image which is given an elevated status by Cisco because it's uh, deemed to be very stable in environments. So if you're unsure of what to use, always go for a safe harbor image. Uh, so now let's move on to the nitty gritties of uh, actually doing an upgrade and the things that can go wrong when you do an upgrade. Um, so the first thing obviously to talk about is uh, what is a boot variable. Uh, a, a boot variable is basically what the device will use to boot itself and uh, reach a state where it can function correctly. And, and, and that, is, that is very important because if boot variables are not set correctly, you can reach a situation where uh, your device does not boot up and it boots or breaks into Raman instead, where you cannot really do anything as such. Right? So sitting on the device, uh, the easiest way to check how the boot variable is set is just do a show boot var. Uh, that should give you a lot of information in terms of <clears throat> what the boot variable is, uh, what the config register is, and so on. So I've, I've given a sample output of the command here. You can see that the, for the 6500 that we were testing with, uh, the boot variable has been set to 12.233SXJ5, uh, right? And uh, another way to check your boot variable is you could just do a show run uh, pipe include boot. And this will give you the actual command out of the running config. And this is what you actually entered and configured on your box uh, so that the device can boot up using that specific uh, iOS image. Uh, now, there are certain platforms which uh, allow you to configure more than one boot variable. And this is important uh, in situations where 
uh, your first boot variable does not work or for some reason uh, it's been deleted by mistake and, and all of that, right? So all you really need to do is just use the same command and uh, configure boot variables uh, a number of times. And again, you can do a show boot var. Uh, all of the boot variables that you've configured will be listed here. One important thing to note here is they're listed in a specific sequence, and the sequence is uh, the order in which you entered the boot variables. And this specific sequence is always what is chosen to boot up your switch. So in our situation, we can see two boot variables uh, listed there. Uh, you have the SXJ5 uh, image and you have the SXJ3 image. And because I entered SXJ5 before SXJ3, that is the order of sequence that the device is going to try and boot itself with. So the SXJ5 image will be tried first. If uh, for whatever reason that does not work, we fall back to the uh, SXJ3 image, right? And uh, the show run include boot will again show you the actual commands that have been configured to uh, boot the system. Uh, so this is a general syntax uh, that you want to use uh, when you are configuring the boot variable. You do a boot system flash, uh, you specify your file system, and you uh, specify the uh, image following that, right? As an example, we have the boot system flash, uh, the sxj5.bin file here. Um, one another another thing key another key thing to remember is uh, there are certain platforms which do not allow you to enter more than one boot variable. Uh, for example, the 3750. And in that situation, if you try to configure another boot variable, it simply uh, it simply overwrites the first one, and you're going to use the new one instead of the original uh, configured boot variable, right? Um, Let's move on to config registers, which again form a very uh, important part as the iOS uh, attempts to boot up. Um, so th this is basically specifying certain options that the system can use when it's trying to boot up. And uh, I think the most commonly used config register is for password recovery, where you've lost your password and you want to bypass that and, and recover everything, right? Where you're essentially locked out of the system. So um, certain common config registers that are used uh, are listed here. We have the uh, 2101. Uh, this basically tells the device to boot out of the first available image in your uh, file system. Uh, 2102 tells the switch to boot out of a configured uh, boot variable. So this means that you've gone into the switch, uh, <clears throat> you've configured something, using your uh, boot system flash command, and then you have your config register set as 2102. So this is going to use your pre-configured or user-configured uh, boot image. And 2142 is your well-known uh, uh, config register for bypassing, uh, the for password recovery, where you basically bypass the startup config, and you come up blank, and you want to recover it, and uh, get your switch back up and running perfectly fine. And again, something to note is there are certain uh, platforms which will not allow you to change the config register. So you can always uh, go to the cisco.com site or the release notes and find out uh, if the platform supports uh, changing of the config register or not. Um, the last thing that I'm going to cover is your ROM1 recovery, which is uh, a very key, uh, very key knowledge to have for any engineer. Um, Ramon is basically a, a fallback uh, for any device where uh, I do, I, the device no longer knows how to boot itself, right? So it falls or it breaks into Ramon where it gives you very minimum uh, functionality, just, just enough to try and get the device booted up and back working again, right? So from a switching perspective, uh, Ramon console looks like uh, either Ramon followed by a number or you get a switch uh, and a colon, right? So it's important to recognize this because you need to know when you're in ROMON or not. Now, uh, booting out of ROMON, there are several ways available. Uh, the first thing you need to check is, do you have an available image that you can boot out of directly, right? So you need to identify your file systems. Uh, so in this situation, let's say I know that my file system is uh, boot disk. You can list out the file system using uh, dir space the file system. So in this situation, a dir boot disk. 
and this will list out um, everything that is available in your file system. So as an example here, uh, I listed out the boot disk file system and I can see that I have the SXJ3 uh, image available in boot disk. So if you see an available image, uh, always try and boot using that available image. Uh, the command is very simple, you simply do a boot uh, followed by the file system, followed by the image, uh, which is the last point in the slide here. And uh, the other thing to remember is if you do not know the file systems that are available to you at ROMON, uh, you can do a DEV. And this is going to list out uh, all the file systems which you can use in ROMON. And then you can just go one by one and do a DIR on all of them and find out uh, if there's any available image in there or not. Right? Um, if you do not have an available image uh, in any of the file systems, uh, you have to somehow find a way to get an image into the switch or the device. So certain platforms uh, have a built-in uh, TFTP recovery method where you can key in or configure even in ROM on very basic things such as the IP address, the default gateway, the subnet mask, and your TFTP server. And then you run through your TFTP command in ROM on and you try and uh, uh, download an image from your TFTP server into one of the file systems uh, that is available in ROMON. Uh, there's a very good Cisco document publicly available uh, to understand this. That has been listed here. Uh, another alternative method is uh, using USB drives. Again, this is very specific to certain platforms. Uh, so some platforms do allow you to plug in a USB drive and boot the system by using the USB drive as a file system. So instead of using uh, boot disk or disk zero and all of that, you can specify that the USB drive is my file system and uh, I can boot using that. Uh, now as a last resort, if absolutely everything fails, uh, you can always use the X modem. X modem is basically a, a functionality where uh, you need to be consoled into the device and uh, the image has to be present on your uh, PC that you're using to console and the image is transferred over the console cable to your device. So uh, again, the reason that we say this is a last resort is because X modem transfers are extremely, extremely slow. Uh, this is uh, completely dependent on the baud rate that you set for your console cable, uh, which cannot go very high either way. So it's extremely slow and it'll probably take you at least uh, one or two hours to get something via X modem. So always try the first few methods if everything fails and your switch is down, uh, X modem is pretty much the only way to go, right? Um, so this covers uh, iOS upgrade uh, basics and what's needed for that. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Karthik to walk you through high CPU on the CAT 3K, 4K, and the 6K. Right, thanks, Aninda. Okay, uh, this is Karthik here, and uh, I'm from the LAN switching team and working as a DAC escalation engineer. And uh, today in this section, we are going to discuss about how to troubleshoot high CPU situation. So high CPU situation is commonly seen in any LAN campus, right? So now, how do we approach high, trouble, high CPU uh, troubleshooting? First of all, we need to identify what is causing high CPU. There could be only two reasons. We can bro broadly categorize into two, into two reasons. First one is intra, the other one is process. First of all, we need to identify if the high CPU utilization is because of a process or an interrupt. What do you mean by process? For example, if a switch has to process something, or if a, if a switch has to process a task, it has to get a process, or which will be allocated with a stipulated amount of time, and the process has to complete its task within that stipulated amount of time. If, I'm, if the process is not gonna complete within the time, it's gonna buy more and more CPU cycle, which is going to trigger a high CPU situation. So uh, when do we see a, a process choking the CPU? There are a few scenarios where we had seen uh, if a process is, is in kind of a stuck state or if, is it, if it is in a hung state or because of some hardware limitation where the CPU is always expected to be a little high, let's say like a, in 3750 platform we have a Hulk LED process which is expected to consume at least 30 percentage of the CPU the max, and it could also be because of some kind of software defects or the CPU can go high, 
or if you are using an unsupported hardware, like uh, mostly we had seen, like if you're going to use an unsupported uh, transceiver, which is uh, not manufactured by Cisco, or uh, it could be some other uh, platform where, where it doesn't meet the, the minimum requirement of iOS and things, it's going to choke up the CPU. So in that situation, you might not be able to do much uh, from the user perspective. Uh, but what you can uh, ideally do is you just need to identify if it is because of a process. If it is a process, uh, you can try um, gathering some traceback logs, um, which could be uh, obtained by executing a command show stack followed by the process ID, which is going to give us a list of traceback. Ideally, it, does, it, it would not make any sense to the end user because um, uh, we need to internally decode these files in the internal tool of Cisco. Uh, which will give us a, a relevant information to identify if it is because of an expected behavior or it, it's because of an, um, a bug and so, so on. Now, so this is about process. Now, what do you mean by interrupt? Let's say if a traffic is uh, sent to the CPU or if a traffic has to be processed by the CPU, the traffic will request the CPU and it will ask uh, it needs something to be processed. In that case, there will be an interrupt sent to the CPU. The rate at which the traffic uh, coming into the CPU, it's going to increase the interrupt rate and which is going to show as a high CPU situation in the environment. So um, most of the time, um, the, the high CPU utilization because of interrupt can be uh, resolved as quick as we identify the source of the traffic. Right. So now, in our experience, we had seen um, the traffic which, ha which is being interrupted by or, in, or sent to the CPU could be because of a few reasons. Let's say if you are sending a traffic which the switch doesn't understand. When I say it doesn't understand, it, it cannot be processed in the hardware. It has to be punted to the CPU for processing. Or if a, tra if a traffic has to be fragmented, then it has, uh, for the reassembly and things, it has to go, go to the CPU for further processing. So those traffic will be um, sent to the CPU or the traffic itself is distant to the CPU. Let's say you have an IP address configured on your switch, and if you're going to ping, the traffic will be sent to the CPU. So uh, any traffic distant for the, the switch itself will go to the CPU. So things like that. Now, if, if you're going to identify the CPU utilization is because of traffic, now these are the steps we can follow to identify who is the source and how we can mitigate that. Okay, now in this section, I'm going to cover how or what are commands you can execute to identify the source of the traffic. And uh, you can also identify the packet format which is being sent to the CPU. First of all, uh, let's take an example of Catalyst 3K. It is 37, let's say on a 3750 platform, you are seeing a high CPU utilization. What are commands you can execute? The first command that you can execute is show process CPU sorted which is going to list out the process in an ascending order, I'm sorry, in a descending order. And with that, you should be able to identify the top process which is being used, in, uh, which is using most of the CPU cycle or which is choking the CPU altogether. Now, how do you differentiate um, uh, the CPU is utilized because of process or interrupt? In the show process CPU sorted output, you should be able to see uh, in the very first line, the percentage, the total percentage of utilization followed by the interrupt. So if you see relatively more uh, uh, percentage of cycles being occupied by the interrupt, then you can identify it is because of the traffic. Now, uh, how do we know if the CPU uh, uh, issue is seen in the past also? You can use an ex uh, you can use the command show process CPU history, which is going to give us a, a trend report for la for the past 72 hours, which is going to tell us what what was the utilization before. Now now that we identified the utilization was because of traffic. Now how do we know uh, which kind of traffic is being punted to the CPU and what kind of traffic uh, uh, is being punted to the CPU? This is a command which is very handy in 3K. The command is show controller CPU interface. This is going to list you the, the queues that are available in, in the CPU. Uh, namely, like, a, let's say 3K platform has got like 14 queues, namely like a, the spanning tree or a, a layer to forwarding. The other one is broadcast queue. So for each and every um, unique traffic, we have a separate queue 
and uh, uh, looking at the the output of show controller CPU interface, we will be able to identify what kind of traffic is being choked. In the output, you should be able to see the number of packets hitting the queue and the number of or number of packets being dropped by the CPU. Now that we identified uh, some queue is choked, now how do we know what packet is going into that queue? If you execute this command, debug platform CPU queue, followed by the queue for which you see drops or high uh, uh, rate of traffic, it's going to list out the packets which are being punted. So from the packet, you should be able to see the source MAC, the source IP, the destination IP, the destination MAC, and sometimes you should be able to see the, the port number as well. So this will give us an idea who is sending the traffic, and if you are able to track the MAC address or the IP address uh, from, the, from the packet field that you found, you should be able to find out the generator or the traffic generator. Now, fairly, this is going to be the same strategy we'll be using in any platform. Now let's say in 4400, what are the commands that we can use? The first command is a very, very handy command. Uh, if you execute show platform health, it's going to list out all the processors that are uh, being alerted with a, a, a defined threshold of th threshold percentage of CPU cycle. If in case, uh, if, uh, if a process is misbehaving, you should see that the, the percentage is uh, more than the threshold that's been allocated. So with that, we should be able to identify uh, which process is misbehaving, and we should be able to narrow down our troubleshooting. Now, now that we know some, some um, traffic is being punted and some process is misbehaving, right? Now, how do we know uh, which queue is being um, uh, choked or what kind of uh, traffic uh, or what kind of traffic pattern we are receiving on the CPU? So this is the command that you can execute. Show platform CPU packet statistics. So this is going to give us the list of queues and the packets being sent to that specific queue and the packets being dropped on that queue. So uh, with this, you should be able to understand what kind of traffic is coming. Like we discussed in 3K, we have a show control CPU interface. Uh, this is going to be a similar command as such to find out the queues where we have a huge number of traffic on it. Now, now that we know which queue is having problem, or uh, how do we identify the packets being punted to the CPU? The command debug platform packet all receive buffer. It's going to enable a debug and it's going to buffer the packet that's being sent to the CPU. And you will always have an option to retrieve the information that we have on the buffer with the command show platform CPU packet buffer. So this, is, this output is also going to be the same uh, kind of output that you get on the 3K. Uh, but the format is going to be a little different. But it, it also has the information about uh, the source MAC, the source IP, the destination IP, the destination MAC, and things. So if you are able to track, uh, tra track down the source MAC or the, the source, you should be able to control the traffic. All right, now here we go. So we have a, a Catalyst 6500, which has been inbuilt with uh, lots of internal tool, which will be very, very helpful during the troubleshooting. And one such tool that we have on 6500 is um, uh, debug Nedia Capture RX. So this is going to behave like the same command but that we have on 4500, like debug platform packet all receive buffer. But uh, the, the format of the packet and the output that we get out of that uh, debug, it's going to be uh, pretty much precise, and it, we should be able to identify the source very easily. And uh, so the, the first debug command is going to buffer all the packets in the, in the, in the local buffer. And re to retrieve the information out from the buffer, the command that we use is show NetDR captured packets, which is going to give us the, the, the packet format. This includes lots and lots of fields which, uh, which the other platform doesn't have. Um, it has the, the source IP, the source MAC, destination IP, the destination MAC, the source port, the destination port, the source interface, the source VLAN, and source index and things, so which we'll be uh, covering it under a live demo. So uh, I'll be showing you a, a live demo of a, a real-time scenario in that we should be able to see the significance and significance of each and every field. Now, how do we clear the buffer capture? Uh, in case of, uh, if you want to um, run a debug and if the buffer is already filled and you want to capture a new set of packet, by default, it overrides the buffer. But if in case you want to clear the existing buffer, you can use this command, debug, net, clear, capture, which is going to clear the existing buffer. 
All right. So um, and all these debug commands that we have on 3K, 4K, 6K, right? You can run at any point of time. So you, you must be scared that uh, if you run a, a debug command um, on a high CPU situation, it might crash the switch. But uh, these debug commands are especially meant for uh, uh, high CPU troubleshooting. So and these uh, debug commands are alerted with special ASICs and things. So running these commands um, during a high CPU situation is always um, recommended. Uh, so that we can identify the root cause and we can resolve the issue as early as possible. And it's not going to impact any of the traffic. Now, uh, what is the significance or what is going to impact if we have a high CPU situation? Let's say you have a, a PC which is connected to, uh, uh, to the switch. And uh, you have another PC which is connected to the switch again. And if there is a communication happening between these two, the traffic is a flow through traffic which doesn't require any kind of CPU processing. So normally on a high CPU situation on a LAN switching campus, right, we should not be seeing much impact because all the traffic is being processed in hardware and um, it should not impact the performance of the flow through traffic. But it would uh, impact, it would impact the, uh, the traffic that is being sent to the CPU. For example, you have an SNMP monitoring tool which is going to pull your uh, uh, switch for uh, the manageability and things, which is destined for the CPU itself. So those kind of traffics will be impacted. Even your SSH or a telnet traffic will be impacted, or your uh, the only way of, uh, or the most relevant way to troubleshoot um, 6500 or any kind of uh, uh, catalyst, uh, catalyst switches on a high CPU situation is to do via console. And most of the time, um, we should be able to do it via remote access via Telnet as well. But it is um, always recommended to do it on a console. All right, now let me just um, walk you guys through a real-time scenario. Let's consider that we have a switch and we have a high CPU situation. And um, what are the things we'll be checking, or how do we approach um, uh, the trouble, or how do we approach this scenario uh, to isolate the issue? I'm going to just uh, pull up my console where I have a 6500 uh, with a high CPU situation and I'll, I'll walk you through guys. All right, so now I'm just bringing up the console. Meanwhile, uh, so let's say now if a traffic uh, has to be routed, right? Uh, for example, uh, a PCA is in VLAN 10 and a PCB is in VLAN 20. So even those traffic, although it is router, they won't go to CPU for processing because we have a Ceph concept in 6400 or in any switches, layer 3 switches, which is going to build a hard hardware entry and which is going to process the traffic um, in the hardware, so which doesn't require any kind of CPU processing. But your care should be taken in case uh, if, uh, if you're going to uh, send a traffic to your default gateway, your layer 3 is going to act like a default gateway for all your uh, host, right? In case if you are going to send an ARP request to the switch to, uh, to get the reachability to the de default gateway, then it's going to be a problem because uh, CPU is busy in, uh, because of the other interrupt traffic. It might not be able to respond back to the ARP request sent by the host, so which would uh, result in an ARP incomplete situation, and that might um, break the entire LAN switching environment. All right, so I have the console here now. I'm going to show you the the current chassis that I'm using, okay? This is 6500, 6504 chassis, and the code that I'm using is one of the latest codes. Um, and let's see the CPU utilization. All right, so now see the utilization here. We see 99% of CPU utilization. So how do we identify this is because of a process or an interrupt? Now see here, this value is going to be the total CPU utilization. And the value just right next to it is the, the interrupt utilization. So 99 minus 81 is the process which is occupied by the process. So you see here ARP input process is occupying 15 percentage, but it is not necessarily because of the ARP input process we see high CPU, but it is because of um, some interrupt traffic or uh, some kind of bogus traffic coming into the switch altogether. So now how do we know 
who is sending this traffic and how do we know from where it is coming and how do we stop it and things we are going to see now so let's go ahead and enable this command debug netdr capture rx and before that i'll also uh, show you the historical data you see here for the past 72 hours we have the report and at least you see here so when you see hashes right in the cpu graph it's going to be the average utilization and when you see dots or stars it's going to be considered as a spike so if if there is a continuous spike then it will be converted into hash which will be considered as an average cpu utilization okay now let's go ahead and debug the cpu to see what kind of traffic is coming in okay now in this debug netdr capture we have few options as well although the rx is going to be of a great help while you are troubleshooting high cpu but these other uh, fields that we have along with this command is going to be of a great use if you are going to troubleshoot something related to connectivity and issues for example let's take tx if you are going to do a, a debug netdr or capture tx right and if you do a ping from this switch it's going to tell you uh, if the packet is going out of the cpu or not so this will be a, a, a handy tool which can be used for even for the connectivity test and things although this command i mean this specific command is not going to uh, cause high, high uh, cpu utilization or it's not going to interrupt any of the production traffic uh, we can use this command at any point of time during the production all right so let's take this output now i have enabled the debug now to look at the capture or the buffer this is what the command we use all right so we see some kind of packets being um, punted to the cpu right but how do we know uh, this is the only guy who is sending this traffic so normally uh, we as a tag engineer what we do is we always look at the the frequency of packets hitting the cpu so let's say now i see one specific mac here right um which is a0800 if i do this i'm going to see the the number of similar packets hitting the cpu so which is going to increase the rate at which or which is going to give us an idea about what kind of packets we are getting and the number of packets we are uh, seeing it so what if we see more than one packet um, um, hitting the cpu we have to identify uh, or we have to rule out the issue one by one so now let's say let, now to start with let's see this packet which we see to be an um, abnormal traffic to the cpu right now look at this you see the source mac which is going to be the source of the traffic and you see the destination as broadcast so if you see a broadcast traffic obviously it is subjected to or which will be destined for the cpu so that's why we see this packet and we also we, ha we also have to look at this field which is the source index which is going to be one of the handy uh, command to identify the ingress interface and we also see a uh, source vlan which is uh, the v which is going to be the source vlan from which the traffic is ingressing in now uh, how are we going to make a sense about this index so what is an index first of all an index is nothing but an identifier which will be allocated by the supervisor to each and every component on the chassis so uh, this is how the supervisor identifies each and every component within the chassis now with this index we should be able to identify what is the the ingress interface okay now let's log in to the switching processor and do a test mcast ltl index and type in the index number so this is this specific output tells us the traffic is ingressing in from the port 3/1 although you can use a traditional way of tracking 
using the command show MAC address table address followed by the MAC address. Oh, I'm sorry, the format should be this way. Which is going to give the same um, output, but uh, in you can use either of the way to identify the source index or the so ingress interface where the traffic is coming in from. And also you have to look at this specific field. You see flood. What do you mean by flood? If I do not know where the destination MAC address is, then I have uh, by default the switch floods the traffic so that it can learn the MAC address. In our case, it seems like the destination MAC address is already a broadcast traffic, so it is always uh, expected to see this flood bit. But even in a, in a normal situation where you have a valid destination MAC, you might see a, a, a flood bit set, which means it, it doesn't understand where the MAC address is learned from, and that's when it tries to identify it by, by sending a, or setting a flood bit. Now, let's see what is the utilization or the load on the specific interface. You see here, the RX load, we see 197, which is, which is, which is relatively abnormal. So although, so although we identified this is the source interface where, from where we see the traffic, we do not have anything connected. So I'm a, at this point of time, I know uh, I, we have a server connected on this. And bringing down this, this specific interface is going to solve the purpose. But it is not always recommended to shut down the interface uh, immediately because we don't know the business of criticality and things, and we don't know the business impact because of it. So now in this output, right, the NetDR capture output. So since this is a R, um, how do we identify what kind of traffic it is? You see a protocol number here. The protocol number 806 signifies it's an R traffic. So now, since it is an ARP traffic, you don't see those uh, uh, source port and destination port and things. But if it, let's say if it is a TCP traffic which is hitting the CPU, you can always see the source port and the destination port. Let's say you see a source port of some random number and the destination port of uh, port 23, right? It's going to tell you what kind of traffic it is because it's a well-known port number from which you can identify it's a telnet traffic which is hitting the CPU. Similarly, uh, if you see multiple traffic hitting or multiple packets with the same destination port hitting, then probably instead of shutting down the entire interface, probably you should shut down the service, uh, the specific service which is causing this issue from the host itself, or uh, you should find out an option of rate limiting the traffic, either by using an access list or by using a control plane policing, um, which is going to bring down the CPU and uh, and it's going to drop the packet in the ha ha hardware itself. Okay, now what are things we can check? Now, this the destination index also matters. Let's see. Um, now, most of the time, if it is destined for a CPU, you would see the, the index as 380. For a normal IP traffic which is destined to a CPU, you might see 380, which is an uh, LTL index assigned for the CPU. And if you want to identify uh, uh, this specific index, one thing that you need to notice, this specific index number is in hexa, hexa num, hexadecimal. So if you have a flood bit there, then you have to add 8000 to this, so which will come like this, just MCAS LTL index, 4 plus 8, which is going to be C001. So which is telling you, which is nothing but 1R. 1R is nothing but the CPU, and 3 slash 1 is one other interface which is active on this um, switch. So this way we should be able to identify the source and the destination, and try bringing down the service or shutting down the interface is going to solve the problem. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to shut down this interface and look at the CPU utilization here. Okay. You see here? The utilization came down to 11 percentage. So this is how uh, we troubleshoot a high CPU situation on a 6500 platform. Now let me quickly go through both the crashes that we encounter. So before I could start with crashes, um, I just wanted to um, emphasize uh, what, what, what is the meaning of a crash. So um, there is a difference between a normal reload and a crash. If, if a switch reloads because of some expected reason, like if you because of some power failure, the switch is reloading. 
then the issue then it is not considered as a crash or if a if a switch is reloaded because you execute a command show, uh, reload then it's going to be considered as a normal reload but not crash right now how do we uh, differentiate it's a crash or uh, or a normal reload the simple handy command that you can use is show version which is going to tell you the reason for reload if you see a reason for reload as power on then it is very clear that we had some kind of power issue and because of which the switch reloaded and if you see something like a reload by reload command then it is something like some remote user had reloaded the switch and because of which the switch reloaded now what now if we identified it is an a genuine crash you would see a crash reason as due to exception or a software parity error and because of some kind of exception that you would see as a reason for reload in that case it is clearly identified as a crash now what what we can do if it is a crash uh, if if the switch crash uh, from the end user perspective right you might not be able to do much over it as i said earlier um, any any cisco switch which is going to crash right it's going to write a, a dump of events in hexadecimal value which um, uh, a normal human re uh, human cannot read it which requires an internal tool which decodes all those uh, hexadecimal files into a relatively um, a readable file and with that we should be able to correlate to uh, correlate the incident to a crash or a hardware failure or due to some kind of hardware limitation now so the the important thing that we need to uh, take care of here right so if you are going to open a case for a crash um, it is always um, expected um, by the tax engineer um, or by the customer who is going to open the case to attach the crash file now um, there are challenges to uh, pull the crash file because it varies from platform to platform so the the, the scope of this uh, specific slide is to cover or is to educate how to uh, retrieve the crash file from the flash system so in this example i'm going to uh, tell you about how to cr retrieve the crash file from 3k 4k and 6k in 3k it's a straightforward method if you have a uh, three switches which are stacked together each and every file system will store its own crash file let's say in a, a stack of three switches if your switch 2 is crashing it's going to write the crash file into flash 2 all you need to do is do a more followed by a space followed by a flash or the file system which is flash 2 colon um the file name of the crash always the crash file starts with the prefix of crash so which will uh, help us to identify that's a crash file and once you get this output please send it to the tac engineer they should be able to decode the crash file and in 4500 uh, uh, it maintains a special folder called crash info where the crash file will be dumped and the way to extract the crash file from it is to execute show platform crash dump which is going to uh, get the similar output that we got on the 3750 and the same can be shared with the tac engineers in 6500 it is little different because uh, uh, unlike the other two architecture 6500 has two processors one is the switching process the other one is a routing processor now uh, whenever there is a crash on one process like a processor let's say if a switch processor is crashing it's going to crash the, the the routing processor as well so it is always very important to capture the crash crash file or retrieve the crash file from both the file system when i say both the file system both the uh, pro processors uh, to decode and to find out the concrete root cause now how do we differentiate the file system yeah. so now if it is a switching processor the file system will be soup hyphen boot disk and if it is a routing processor the file system will be boot flash or boot disk and now if you have a redundant supervisor uh, it has a prefix of slave so it will be slave hyphen soup boot disk slave hyphen boot disk so all you need to do is the simple way more followed by the file system let's say subboot disk colon the crash file which is going to extract the crash file for us so with all this information uh, if you are going to uh, provide the show version as well as the the, the show tech on the crash file um, any tech engineer should be able to respond back to you with the, the with the concrete root cause or at least an idea about what happened during the situation and now I'm going to hand it over to Aninda, who is going to discuss about the layer one troubleshooting. Thank you, guys. Hey, guys. So uh, we're going to wrap up the technology session with uh, just some basic layer one troubleshooting information, uh, more specifically looking at the show interface counters, 
uh, what means what, what is important. Uh, I'll simply touch upon uh, trying to understand why a VLAN interface doesn't come up as well and, and stuff like that, right? So um, when you're trying to troubleshoot uh, layer one information, probably the most handy command that you can do is your show interface uh, output command. Uh, so basically doing a show interface, uh, the interface name, number, uh, and, and that should give you uh, a lot of information about the uh, physical interface itself, right? Uh, some other things that you can also use is a show interface uh, followed by the interface uh, counters errors, and that also gives you a lot of uh, layer one uh, specific uh, errored variables, right? So I have a... a some important uh, counters here that you should be looking at uh, if you're trying to identify uh, layer one trouble. Uh, so first thing is your collisions or your late collisions. Uh, late collisions are something which are commonly caused by uh, duplex mismatches between devices. So in the situation where uh, you have one side configured as a full duplex, and the other side is configured as a half duplex. Uh, what happens in that situation is the half duplex side, uh, it basically has to sense before it can send a packet. So it's always trying to uh, understand, am I allowed to send a packet now or not? And the full duplex side is uh, going to be continuously sending packets no matter what. So this is very, very commonly, uh, a common result of this is your uh, collisions, which leads to uh, a lot of packet uh, drops and slowness in your network. Um, you might also see uh, UDLD uh, and other situations arising out of this, because essentially there are packets that are colliding and being lost uh, on the wire itself, right? Uh, then you have your uh, CRCs. Uh, a, a CRC basically increments when you uh, the switch gets a packet and uh, it verifies the checksum and the checksum fails. So in the situation where you have packets uh, ingressing, and uh, the thing to note is CRC is always checked on ingress. So if you have packets ingressing with uh, corrupted checksums or, or no checksums and all of that, right? That is a bad packet technically, and that uh, increments your uh, CRC counter. Um, then input errors are also another uh, very good indication of uh, layer one trouble. Input errors are again basically corrupted packet. Um, and uh, when these come ingressing into your uh, interface, uh, the input error counter is incremented. So when you do see um, input errors, CRCs, late collisions and all of that uh, incrementing, for late collisions you know check your duplex on both sides. Uh, but for uh, CRC input errors, which are very layer one specific, um, before you can do uh, any sort of troubleshooting above uh, layer one, uh, what TAC is always going to make you do, uh, and which is why you should try and do this from before, uh, is always check your physical medium. And, and this becomes especially important uh, in, the situ in the situation where you have uh, 10G interfaces or you have gig interfaces which are using uh, transceivers and uh, fiber optics because uh, a lot of these are seen uh, in, in that physical uh, medium specifically, right? Um, so what you want to do is uh, change out your transceivers and your GBICs, uh, change it out on both ends, uh, monitor and see if you're still seeing these errors increment or not. Uh, if you're still seeing the problem, change out your fiber optic and monitor back again. Uh, if you're still seeing the problem, change out your physical ports. So that there has to be uh, some sort of physical troubleshooting that has to be done uh, specifically in regard to your CRC and input errors, which are very, very layer one specific. Um, now, uh, pause inputs, outputs, they're not layer one issues, uh, but I've put it here because it's very important to understand uh, what they are. Uh, pause inputs and outputs, they're basically uh, a mechanism for uh, flow control. They're, they're a, a new type of frame which is sent out by the devices themselves uh, to take part in uh, active flow control uh, of packets, right? Um, so they're called pause frames. So when a device, uh, when an interface of a de device uh, receives uh, a pause frame, that increments your pause uh, input. And when a device, when the interface of a device sends out a pause frame, that increments your pause output. So what, what does it really mean? Uh, 
pause input basically means uh, that the other side is being overwhelmed with the amount of traffic that uh, I am sending it. So you as a switch are sending so much traffic to the other side that it is not capable of handling it and it is losing packets. So in that situation, the uh, remote side basically uh, sends you uh, a pause frame. So it, it is a pause input for you. And what you do is you, it indicates, it tells you that you need to slow down. So you start buffering packets a little bit and start sending a little slower. Uh, pause output is exactly the opposite of that, where uh, you are the recipient of a lot of traffic and you are incapable of handling it. So what you do is you generate your pause frame and send it out to the other side, and that increments your uh, pause output on your local interface. Right. So these are important counters to understand. They're not exactly error conditions, but they're still uh, good knowledge to have. Um, the last few things which are important to understand from the show interface output is your uh, overruns. And uh, overruns are basically, uh, they're seen on ingress. So it, it's packets uh, which are being dropped uh, as they're being received by you. And overruns are simply because your input uh, interface does not have enough buffers uh, to buffer the packet and, and uh, hardware switch it or software switch it or whatever has to happen. So in the situation where your input interface is uh, very badly overwhelmed, uh, you will start seeing uh, overruns uh, increment as well. Now overruns sort of go hand in hand with your uh, input queue drops. And this is specific for uh, layer two interfaces, where uh, this is nothing but the hardware buffer itself. So it's just that the hardware buffer is being overwhelmed with the amount of traffic that you're getting. And the interface is no longer capable of handling it. And because it is so excessive, you start uh, dropping the packets on ingress. And that increments your overruns and your input queue drops. Um, a key difference to note here is uh, input queue drops has a different meaning when you think of it for a layer 3 interface. Uh, for a layer 3 interface, the input queue drop is basically a software queue to the CPU. So if you have a packet that is coming into a layer 3 interface, uh, it can be a, a VLAN interface, which is your SVIs, or it can just be a normal routed interface. Uh, in that situation, the uh, input queue is not the hardware queue. Uh, it's the soft queue, which goes to your CPU. So if a packet has to be software switched for whatever reason, it is going to sit in your uh, input queue buffer, the soft queue, before it is sent to the CPU for processing. Um, now the opposite of overruns and input queue drops is basically output queue drops and output drops. Uh, this is the exact opposite where your transmit buffer for an interface is being uh, overwhelmed and the amount of traffic that it is receiving internally from the switch uh, which has to be sent out of the interface is so high that it starts uh, dropping the packets on its output or transmit uh, buffer. right? Um, now, another thing to sort of remember is, uh, because we've seen a lot of problems where the VLAN interface or your SVI uh, is not coming up. And uh, I just want to talk about that quickly for a minute or so. Um, now, the a, a couple of things to remember is your VLAN interface uh, or your SVI is basically tied uh, to your layer 2 VLAN. Right, so your layer three VLAN, which is your SVI, is is tied to your layer two VLAN. So a couple of important things to make sure that you check are uh, a you want to make sure that your layer two VLAN is indeed created. Uh, if your layer two VLAN is not present, your uh, layer three VLAN is never going to come up, and is, you're going to see it as down down. Um, the next and extremely critical par uh, point here is uh, spanning tree must have at least one. Uh, and I repeat, at least one forwarding interface uh, for that layer two VLAN. So even if you have the VLAN existing and uh, for whatever reason that VLAN has been removed or pruned off of uh, pretty much every trunk and it's not assigned to any access port, uh, your layer three VLAN is not going to come up. It is going to be down, down, right? So when you're troubleshooting why your layer three VLAN is down, uh, these two points are very critical. A, make sure your VLAN is created. Uh, B, make sure that at least one interface has that VLAN in a STP forwarding state. So it's not just that it should be allowed, it has to be in an STP forwarding state. And this is just a snapshot of what you see uh, from a show interface output. Uh, 
loved by all of us. So um, this should wrap up the technology session for the day.